Twisted Hippie. Twisted Hippie, 1,000 Pine Points. I have you first. One step closer to getting that all-expense-paid trip to the Tropicana Casino and Spa. We'll play a little poker, sit by the pool. Me and Twisted Hippie. Welcome everyone, uh, Blake Gienta, Gienta, how do you pronounce his name? He's, uh, he knows this is happening and I invited him to come on. So at the end of the, of the show, when I say, I um, apologize, we ran out of time, that might be for real. Uh, or he might actually come on um, and uh, talk with us. Us, meaning me and Camille. Camille's here too, but you can't see him. He's invisible. I can make him visible at any time. Uh, but first, before we, I go into that, I, I titled this uh, Belief Map, Why Apologetics <laughs> Sucks at Evangelism. I mean that. I, I do think apologetics um, sucks at evan evangelism. But let me be clear. This is what I think it's good at. It's good at, at helping those backslidden Christians. It's good at helping those Christians who feel guilty, who, who are in their late teens, early 20s, who feel guilty for some of the things they've done because of their upbringing or because of the culture they're raised in, thinking that certain things that they're doing is wrong, and they feel bad about these things, or they legitimately have done some bad things, and um, they need to change their life, and uh, they go back to the religion that they were raised in. So for those people, I think... Belief Map, uh, which is an apologetics website, and apologetics in general is very useful. Um, also, I do think for those who've never even been raised in Christianity at all, apologetics can be useful for those who are desperate, for those who uh, probably, I'm talking now people who pass their 20s, they're, they're basically not uh, Christians at all, uh, they're rounding their 30s, and, um, and then something bad happens. Divorce, death, tragedy, bankruptcy, something like that. Belief map, apologetics um, can help in that case too. But usually, and this is where I think Christians, right now Christians are just yelling at me, top of their lungs, they hate me. They hate Pine Creek for what he's saying. But this is, a, I'm going to say something now I think they're going to agree with me on. And that is that... It's the person who loves, it's the person who cares, shows empathy, who is most likely to impact the non-believer. So imagine that 30-year-old person who's something bad happened in their life, and a guy like Blake comes and, um, and talks to him or her. Do you think the belief map is going to be a good thing to start with? No. Someone who just, let's say, lost their spouse in a tragic accident. You think belief map's going to help them? No. What's going to help them is an arm around the shoulder. What's going to help them is saying, hey, you might get to see her again, right? Can you imagine that, how powerful that is to someone who's desperate and, and suffering in pain? Christians are agreeing with me now. It's showing the love of Jesus, right? This is what makes the difference. Stuff like belief map, no. That's going to come in handy later when the person who converts to see their now dead wife starts to doubt. And they're going to think, hmm, is this really real? Is this really, really true? What if this is just all make-believe and I'm, I've deceived myself here? Then Blake can pull out belief map and keep them solidified in the belief system. <laughs> Too much? <clears throat> oh, Blake is here? Um, someone's saying in the live stream chat, Blake's here. Okay, but Blake, I don't... Oh, yeah, there, I see you. Welcome, Blake. I think Blake agrees with what I just said, that, that it's um, the love for Jesus, the love for your fellow man, which can be way more powerful than um, any apologetic could be. Now, I, I'm, um, I'm not going to go through all of it. I know it's really small. But one thing that I, um, I found interesting... 
is the part here, what's so great about belief map? It serves an apologetics as an apologetics hotline. Imagine equipping everyone in the world with something like Pocket Apologist, an artificial intelligence available to present for your custom customized evidences. I, I'm confused. Is evidence ever evidences, or is, isn't evidence plural already? But may, I've seen so many people say evidences that maybe, it, and I probably have too. Anyhow, um, supporting Christianity to offer instant scholarly answers to complex questions. Yeah. I have a feeling some people would disagree with that. I'm sure there's some scholarly stuff here, or sorry, sorry, a lot of scholarly stuff. But for example, let's, let me go to the search bar. One thing that I've talked about is uh, the first gospel was Mark, according to many, um, and that it's an Elisha, Elijah narrative. So let's say if I put in the word Elijah in the search bar, is that going to be in here? Did Jesus rise from the dead? No. Did Christians desire to acquire a missing body? Did the Jerusalem church know Jesus' burial location? Is the risen is risen a good evangelism movie for defending? Is risen no, that's the movie? The ascension of Isaiah. As, that could be close. Mm. No, see, I'm not one of my biggest complaints, maybe it's in here, but I'm not seeing it, is um that when you're reading the gospels, you're reading mostly fiction. And it's based on Old Testament narratives. And so when I put Elisha, Elijah, maybe if I put Brody in, no. See, I'm not seeing one of my major complaints. Anyhow, let's get back to uh, the purpose. Statement of faith. Our statement of faith, God is the greatest possible being. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, holy, eternal, creator of the universe, moreover, God alone is the proper object of our worship and service. God is a trinity. Jesus, one of the three persons of the trinity. The, see, there's a lot of Christians who are not Trinitarians. They're called Unitarians. Uh, the gospel is the good news for believers. Good news for what? Why is it good? Um, by which you are saved. Saved from what? If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain that Christ died for a sin according to the scriptures, <laughs> which scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day. So yeah, this is the creed. Um, not all creeds are true. Salvation, but through Christ we can be saved through God's... Okay, here we go. So what are we saved from? But through Christ we can be saved through God's wrath. That's important. God gets angry. Righteous anger. That is hell, where non-believers are forever condemned, rather than through baptism or any other works. See, this is, I think there's a shift in America happening right now that uh, a lot of Christians are realizing that if you talk like this, it's going to hurt your evangelism. <laughs> I, I think that's really true. Why, <clears throat> so why is this belief map apologetic website even needed? Um, so... One of the things that I've always said to apologists is that let's assume Christianity is true for a second. Who cares? Who cares if it's true? What does it matter if it's true? And a lot of apolog apologists get taken aback when I ask that question. Now, I believe we should believe as many true things as possible, but sometimes believing false things can actually be, be beneficial. And um, so then the question becomes why, and there's a lot of true things that we don't need to know. There's probably a lot of tr true things in physics and chemistry and stuff that most people have no clue about, and, and neither do they need to. Why do we need to know this? Why do we need to know the good news of Jesus, of the gospel? It's because of hell, because it, it's to be saved from hell. This is what I think Blake believes. Well, he says it right here, in hell, where non-believers are forever condemned rather than through baptism or any other works. So it's, it's grace, not works. <laughs> I just did a video of how grace is like a socialism. I know that bothers <laughs> these types of Christians. Justification, and we, the saved, are saved because Jesus bore our sins in his holy body on the cross, because he suffered the penalty. Okay, now why am I talking about this? The Bible is at 66 books. That gets rid of some uh, Catholics. <laughs> um other text sermons may be inspired as well, but the Bible is unique in that it's securely known to be inspired and can be used to judge other works and teachings. Okay, I'm bringing this up because my guess is, and I don't know this for sure, I tried to find Blake's personal testimony online, I couldn't find it, so maybe he'll tell me later, but my guess is 
that Blake believed this stuff, and most apologists believed, evangelical Protestant apologists anyhow, believe most of this stuff long before they knew the content within this belief map. So what is, why do I bring that up? Before you start screaming genetic fallacy or anything like that, that I'm not talking about that means it's false or that means it's true. No, I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is this hits hard on the issue of bias. It's like, okay, I have this belief. I believe this. I believe God's the Trinity. I believe he's the greatest possible being. I believe the gospel is true, all this. And, but now I'm in my late teens, early 20s, and I'm starting to doubt. And I love, I love it when I read the Bible and read all the, the, the evidences for what I believe. So I'm going to search out everything that supports what I believe. And he's done that here. And to be fair... I'm going to put in the stuff that uh, goes against what I believe. But here's the problem. It's a problem of bias. How do we know? What if? What if? What if all the objections to what you believe, you, you kind of dismiss them because of the fact that you have this bias to believe it? Now, Blake, I know you're in here, and I know you're listening, and I know you have a wife who's a Christian, and you know, I think you have a a baby on the way, or maybe you just had a baby. Can you imagine, Blake, how terrible it would be if you left Christianity, like, in the next 12 months? Can you imagine the tears that your family will shed? I guarantee you they will cry, like, not just a little bit. They will sob like crazy. How do I know this? Because this happened to me. Now, I'm saying this because whenever there is that emotional tie to a belief system, that's a red flag that biases are at its extreme. That confirmation bias is at probably at its extreme. We don't have websites uh, of belief map for, I don't know, like for certain chemistry things. <laughs> there's not apologists for chemistry. Now, there's, in fact, in the sciences, your goal is to, to just, just constantly knock things down and try to just disprove, disprove, disprove in quotes. But it seems like in religion, in, in Christianity, it's, um, it's no, we got to have walls and protect and help lead people to Jesus because there's eternal con condemnation. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Camille soon, but first I want to play a video to support some of the stuff I'm saying. Let me see here. So this is Mike Lacona when he was debating um, Matt Dillahunty. And, you know, Mike Lacona is a historian. And he likes to talk about the um, minimal facts, for example. But in the beginning, this is my guess, my opinion, why I think a guy like Mike Lacona really believes. And all this other stuff, like the stuff you would find on Belief Map, is secondary. Take a listen here. Let me make sure volume's up. Uh, completely dead or near death. Ooh, that's fast. I was watching that at, <laughs> that at 3x earlier. And they have an out-of-body experience normally. They come out of the body and they go places or... Okay, I'm going to rewind this to 748. But paranormal experiences. Well, this is a friend of mine. Her name is Kim. Uh, I've known her for several years. Uh, Kim... Her mom, her sister, and several of her family members have dabbled in occultic practices over the years. She's told me about some of the things that she has seen, the kind of stuff that makes the hair on the back of your neck would stand up. Well, Kim told me that about 23 years ago, I think it was, she and three others were working, uh, were playing, ah, oh, thank you so much, appreciate it. They were playing with a Ouija board in her kitchen, and uh, they are in high school at the time, and so they're playing the Ouija board, and there's this... Uh, metal trash can with a metal lid in the kitchen. I said, Kim, a metal trash can and lid in your kitchen? She said, well, we lived out in the country, you know. So, yeah, so as they're playing the Ouija board, all of a sudden, uh, they saw the lid, the metal lid on the can, just lift up and hover over the can for a moment, and then it launched itself against the wall, hits the wall, goes flat against the wall, and it's as though someone was holding it against the wall, and then it just slid down real slowly down the wall, and then it would hit the ground and started to spin like a, like a coin. And of course, they're just falling over each other, trying to get out of the room, to run out of that room. 
And I've seen correspondence between her recent correspondence within the last month where she asked them, hey, do you remember this event? Yeah, and it's still, 23 years later, it still spooks them to this day. So there's stuff like this that strongly suggests that there is a supernatural uh, dimension in reality. And of course, there are tons of stories like this. I could give you some of my own that I've experienced. I could give you some of my own that I've experienced. I think, uh, and I've been saying this for years, and people who have followed me for years can attest to this. Um, for many Christians, the primary reason they believe is because of the things Mike Lacona just said. And by the way, for the record, I think it is so embarrassing for a professional PhD historian to just believe this story because it's your friend. Like, I'm a <laughs> apoplectic. There's a big word. I'm just shocked. Um, but my point is, many it, Christians, if you're listening, many of your experiences of God, that the types that Mike Lacona is talking about right now, let me make some predictions here. The majority of, the majority of these types of experiences happened in your late teens, early 20s. Am I wrong? Late teens, early 20s at a time when you're trying to figure out who you are as a person, at a time when you are most likely hormones raging, chemicals in your body are raging, at a time most likely where you're the most sleep deprived, whether you're in university, Bible college or whatever. Isn't it funny how these types of experiences happen in that, around that age? And isn't it Interesting that experiences like seances and so forth coincide with a lot of movies you watch. This is why I think most Christians, the pri these, these are the, for many Christians, the primary reason why they believe is because of experiences like this. I, I had a, a talk with my mom recently, and um, she was saying how I shouldn't have my channel. And uh, I said, why? And she said, well, you know why. I <laughs> said, <So> what? <laughs> well, because you're causing people to doubt. Well, why is that bad, Mom? You know why. She was terrified to say the word hell. But then she said, but Doug, you're going to come back to Christianity. I guarantee it. I go, well, why do you say that? Because of all those experiences you had when you were in your late teens, early 20s. And I, like Mike Lacona, can give you experience stories as well. But looking back, I now attrib attribute them to different things. Okay, I want to move on. Uh, poor <laughs> poor um, Camille, he's sitting there. Shut up, Doug, I want to come on. Okay, he's coming. Um, so this is a debate between Michael Lacona and uh, Kevin. What's his first name? Someone type it in the... Camille, do you remember his first name? Put it in the Facebook chat. Um... But uh, Lacona versus Kevin, did Jesus rise from the dead? I'm going to start this at a point where um, because of this belief in the supernatural, because of this belief of the, all these miracles, these experiences that Christians attribute to the supernatural realm, this will tie in to apologetics later. What I'm saying is God has a particularly weak... Let me slow it down, back it up. Low because God doesn't do it that often. What I'm saying is God has a particularly weak tendency to intervene supernaturally in the affairs of the world. We see this every day, all of us, all the time. Mike, if you're right and we can't know this, let's watch this bottle of water. I predict that within five minutes, God will not supernaturally raise this bottle of water off the table. If you're right, we can't know one way or the other. All right, so... In fact, if you're right, we could bet right now. I could bet you $300 on this if you're right. All right, but... Okay, this is... Now, for a lot of... I, I used to be a Christian. I know how Christians would view this. They just, like, said, this is ridiculous what this non-Christian, probably an atheist, is talking about. How dare he put a water bottle in there and say, I predict that God's not going to do anything. But there's a tremendous point being made here, and that is that there's a huge... God, even if this God exists, this God has a huge desire not to do stuff like this. 
He does not do this. In fact, I would bet every Christian, I, my guess is every Christian watching this, if they had to bet $1,000, they would all bet that God's not going to do it. Why do they, why would they bet that way? Christians, ask yourself that. Why would you bet that God would not raise that bottle off the table? What's your reason? Well, because it doesn't fulfill any purpose, Doug. Well, no, it would fulfill a big purpose. Odds are this guy would, his uh, confidence in a God would go sky high if it rose, and he might even become a Christian. Why would you bet against God that he would not lift this bottle? I'll tell you why. Because in your life experiences, God doesn't work this way. <laughs> you can even believe in a God. You can be a person who believes most of Christianity. You know, maybe there's a few things you disagree with a guy like Blake or... But you, you would not say for one second God's going to raise, do a miracle, and suspend or, you know, go against gravity. This is a huge point that we'll, come, we'll talk about when it comes to the resurrection. But that's just natural law right here. There's no, no that's not uh, natural There's law. no intent behind it. Well, let, let's wait, put it. Wait, Mike, let's watch God right now. Let's watch God see if he lifts up the bottle. Well, maybe he doesn't want to do that. Well, maybe he doesn't. That's not my point, Mike. He does, yours, my your point, point is he is doesn't that, do it often. My point is not whether God wants or not. My point is he's not raising it up. Greg, I'll be 51 in two weeks, okay? Now, this is my first time in Temecula. So I guess it's just not my, in 51 years, however many days that is, uh, uh, in 51 years, uh, this is my first time to Temecula. So I guess you could say, it's not really my tendency to come to Temecula. So given this, how often I come to Temecula, I'm not here this evening. Well, of course, that's not what I'm saying, Mike. Well, what are you saying? Well, Mike, you're confusing. Mike's confusing two different kinds of probability. He's confusing prior probability with posterior probability. The prior probability that you would have been here tonight is very low indeed. The posterior probability that you're here tonight is very high. You're so the prior the probability two. is easily overcome by the evidence. In this case, yes. And I would say the same applies to the resurrection. Okay, this is the important part. If you want to give the resurrection, you'd say, well, there's a one chance in a hundred billion that God would raise someone from the dead. That's easily overcome by the historical evidence we have that the event occurred, given the context in which Jesus lives and dies, who he claimed to be, what he did in terms of astonishing deeds, and then we also have evidence that he did rise from the dead. Well, it would be if, again, you could show that your hypothesis has, and here you're confusing the issues, explanatory scope, explanatory power. Okay, so I played that part because I wanted to show just how strongly a guy like Mike Lacona and probably Blake believe that that a resurrection, let's say it's one in a hundred billion chance that a 2,000 year old text overcomes that for a guy like Mike Lacona to believe. Now, I don't believe that's the case. I don't think that, I think it's these experiences that he probably ex experienced in his late teens and early 20s and his indoctrination, his teachings, his community, his culture. I think those are the main influences, factors in, in why he believes and not so much that these historical texts, uh, historical in quotes, um, overcome this one in 100 billion probability. I tell you, it's... I, and Christians know this. I think intuitively they know that someone who's not desperate, someone who's not indoctrinated, someone who's content in life, who is in their mid-30s, they're not going to become a Christian. That The odds of them becoming a Christian are so low, especially if they don't meet a Christian woman <laughs> or a Christian man. Christians, they know th there's stats on Christian uh, evangelism. And they realize that the best way, the, the best people to evangelize to are the very, very young, your own children, for example, and the very, very desperate, and, or the backsliders, who uh, you got to find them when they're guilty. Okay, uh, you ready, Camille? I probably said too much. Okay, he's giving me the green two thumbs up. Okay, let me on, uh, don't say anything yet. Did, you say, did I say anything you disagreed with? Oh, I still don't hear you. Why? Did you mute yourself? 
There, there we go. go. There yeah, I, I wasn't really listening. Sorry, <laughs> I was talking to Blake in the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay, but before uh, uh, Blake, um, I'm not looking at the chat right now, but uh, if you hear this, maybe Facebook message me and let me know if you want to come on and you're invited to. By the way, apparently Blake just had a baby uh, on ah. the 27th, so congratulations, um, obviously. Yeah, I, I was I was right. I thought he was he either did have a baby or one's coming soon. Okay, let me put the belief ba map back on. Um, so Blake, one thing that I noticed about this belief map is uh, I hate giving unsolicited advice, and please just feel free to reject this. But when you click down, I like it that it it, you, it comes down a whole bunch of different topics. But you should be able to click it again and it collapses again. Or have a little, you know how you have a down arrow here? You need an up arrow. Because the only way to get back to collapse it is to click off and then click back. So that's my only, um, what would you call that? What type of critique is that? Uh, user experience. Yeah, user experience critique. My other critique is, I, maybe I'm missing it, but the things that I think a guy like me and Camille would push back against uh, I think a lot of it's not here. Have you gone through this, Camille? Yeah, it's it's pretty incomplete. And also, what's probably more, more concerning is that a lot of the links are actually circular, so they like loop back uh, on themselves. So, like, talk about a circular argument, right? Here, you can literally spend eternity trapped in a loop clicking from one website, web page to the other and then back. Uh, specifically, the section about the plausibility of the resurrection. So like, if Jesus was actually killed, how plausible is it that God would want to raise him from the dead? Links to the section that talks about the resurrection. But that section links back to the section about the plausibility. So that's, uh, that's circular. Um, yeah. I wanted to but just, actually yep I was just gonna say I wanted to show Blake something here first um, I'm I'm on the fair Mormon website and they don't theirs is not as good as yours I, I'll I'll give you that but basically you can go on the Mormon website and they have a section here called fine fine answers and um, let's see they had a critique section as well and you can basically, here's Mormon scholars testifying on certain things. Um, and you can basically go by topic and find the things you want to find. So my point of showing you this is to say, beliefs that you deem false are doing similar things to what you're doing. And it's like they realize there's criticisms against their own beliefs, like Mormonism, and they have answers. Wouldn't you know it? They have answers to all these critiques, just like you have answers to all the critiques against Christianity. They and they're, they're not scared. They present the critiques against Mormonism, just like you are not scared and present the critiques against evangelical Christianity. So what's going on here? How can these Mormons still be Mormon considering all these objections to Mormonism? Blake, how would you answer that question? Think about it. Don't answer it now. But whatever answer you have, I would say that that's probably what's happening with you. And maybe even me. And this is the problem of bias and the best way and trying to figure out the best way to lower it. Yeah, and uh, actually, the main reason why I, why I wanted to talk about Blake and Belief Map is that Apologists, when they discuss the resurrection, love to talk about all the evidence, but evidence is just one component of evaluating a historical hypothesis. The other one is what's called plausibility or prior probability, and it's just how plausible a hypothesis is um, independent of the evidence, given what we know about how the world works, right? So if imagine like a patient comes to a doctor with a fever, what's more likely that the diagnosis is going to be a common flu or the bubonic plague. 
most people would probably think that even before doing any medical examination at all, it's more, we can say that it's more probable it's going to be a common flu, right? So that's the concept of prior probability. And most apologists don't actually bring this up because I think they don't really know that this is a thing, like that's a concept in epistemology. But Blake is one of the few um, apologists who is a Bayesian uh, he likes uh, Bayesian epistemology. So he has a section in Belief Map specifically addressing the question of the prior probability of the resurrection. Because even ha if you have amazing evidence, like 500 eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus and conversions of Paul and James and stuff like that, if the prior probability of the resurrection is extremely low, that uh, evidence is not sufficient to warrant belief. So on one hand, I want to congratulate Blake uh, because I like that he's one of the few apologists to talk about it. But on the other hand, I would I actually wanted to go over the reasons that he gives for thinking that the prior probability of the resurrection is actually high and showing that they are all shit. So let's do you that. Have, you have to whisper <laughs> that word. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. I uh, hope right. you're not going to be demonetized. Maybe Blake's not going to click off now. Uh <laughs> okay, let me just summarize what you said. Um, basically, a lot of Christians think that because a God exists and can do amazing things, then that raises the prior probability that Jesus could be raised from the dead. And what you're saying is, no, that doesn't follow. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very important to realize that you don't have to be uh, an atheist or a mater materialist or a naturalist to think that it's very improbable that God would intend to raise Jesus. Just think about it. Like There are billions of people in the world who believe in God and believe that miracles happen, including resurrections, but still are not convinced by the historical evidence, right? Like There are even millions of people who worship and believe the same God that Blake does, Yahweh, you know, El Elohim, El Shaddam, El Elyon, but don't think that Jesus was raised. Uh, they are called the Jews. Uh, so <laughs> let's Muslims. just grant for, yeah, the, let's just grant, grant for the sake of argument that Yahweh exists, not just any God, specifically Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And let's just grant for the sake of argument that miracles do actually happen, including resurrections. And let's talk about how, what is the prior probability that Jesus would be raised. And I like the clip that you played uh, by, uh, you know, um, the, the clip of, uh, yeah, the clip of Greg Coven. I like it because I recommended it. Uh, <laughs> but it's ba it basically shows you that even if God exists, the prior probability of the resurrection is very low uh, because of what we see around us, right? Like if I pick up a book, I can predict that in the next hour, two hours, 24 hours, God is probably not going to intend to um, send the book flying across the room supernaturally, right? We can actually predict the intentions of God using our past experiences. And we can do the same thing with the resurrection. So basically, even if, if Yahweh exists, we can establish that he has a very strong tendency not to raise people from the dead. So the idea that Jesus was one of the few exceptions is inherently very improbable. But and Jesus is special. Reasons. Camille, Jesus, yeah, you, Jesus is yeah. special. Yeah, so let's, let's go over, over the reasons for thinking that uh, Yahweh made an exception with Jesus and decided to raise him specifically and not some other people like um, my great-grandfather, for example. Well, because he said that he, would, he, he predicted his uh, resurrection. And is that a minimal fact? <laughs> is that something that Muslim and Jewish and um, Hindu historians agree? Like, yeah, if you ask Bart Ehrman, do you think that Jesus predicted his own death in advance? Do you think he's going to say yes? <laughs> but Jesus said he was God, and he forgave people of their sins, and he said, uh, me and the Father are one. And is that a minimal fact? Is that something that a vast majority of New Testament scholars agree on? Or is that something that just Christian scholars agree on? But Camille, okay, he ate, and he, he walked, and he talked to people after he was raised from the dead. 
And is that found in our earliest and best sources, like the letters of Paul? Does Paul say, Jesus appeared to me and I poked his wounds? Or yeah. is it only found in some Gospels, later ones, not even in Mark, the earliest Gospel, just in Luke and John? Did you actually know that there isn't any detail, like specific detail about the physicality of Jesus's body that appears in more than one gospel. Like if you think about it in Luke, Jesus eats a piece of fish, which shows that he has a physical body, but that detail is only found in Luke. In John, Thomas gets to poke his wounds. And that's a detail that's only found in John. In the gospel of Matthew, the episode is missing, even though the supposed author, Matthew, the tax collector from Galilee, was supposedly present in the room when that happened. Decided not to record it. That's uh, such a shame. We would have uh, much higher confidence in so that you're, happening today. So you're just people. being overly skeptical and just saying, okay, Jesus never even really predicted his resurrection, death and resurrection. He never really um, said that he was God and could do things like this. He never... Um, actually ate and walked with these disciples. You're basically saying that because all these claims are not minimal facts, we can reject them? Well, I think that uh, the biggest strength of the minimal fact apologetic is that it's supposedly, if you take only the core facts that all or vast majority of scholars believe in or agree on, regardless of their personal bias, so regardless of whether they are Christian, Jews, Muslims, or atheists, it's still reasonable to believe in the resurrection because the resurrection best explains these minimal facts. But the problem is that if you actually get to talk about the resurrection in detail, for example, about the prior probability of the resurrection, the apologists have to bring in additional claims mm -hmm. that only Christians agree with, right? You have to be a Christian already in order to be convinced that, for example, Jesus ate a piece of fish and that uh, shows that um, he was raised bodily. Here's a, um, here's a specific example from the Belief Map uh, website. A, this is under the category, Jesus rose from the dead. And it says, did Jesus rise from the dead? Introduction, Christianity stands or falls on this. And it says, yes, after all, Jesus' body went missing. People were saying he appeared to us. The, apostle, the apostles, Paul, Mary, etc., proclaimed we physically met with Jesus after he died. Now, is that true? Is that a minimal fact that that they even claimed this, proclaimed this? And I would say no, except for maybe Paul. Um, and this is the challenge I've set, given for years. I don't know if Blake has actually even heard this, that find me, when we think of eyewitness testimony, we think of people actually stating who they are as a witness and either saying, talking, or writing in the first person what they saw or didn't see. And in, did you know, Blake, that there is no examples of this for Jesus' resurrection other than Paul? And even then, it's not a bodily resurrection, most a lot of scholars think. So we don't have anybody proclaiming. We don't have the apostles. We don't have Mary proclaiming that they physically met Jesus after he died. We have anonymous texts saying this. Peter's probably the closest, but even then, he just says, states that he, well, assuming First Peter's legitimate, <laughs> um, stating that he was a witness to Jesus' sufferings, but not, he doesn't actually come out and say that he was a witness to his um, resurrection. And actually, the first chapter of Revelation is the closest, too, but that's clearly a vision, sort of like Paul's. So anyhow, here's, here's the problem I have with your website, Blake, is because... Um, it seems like it's not. It's you. You say you're bringing up scholarly articles, but to me, this sounds like Sunday school again. I think back thirty years, twenty, yeah, thirty years ago, twenty-five years ago, this is the stuff I would hear in Sunday school. And then as I got older, I realized, oh wow, no, no, not not quite. Um, Camille, you remember all the we had like different sayings, uh, analogies for why just because God exists doesn't mean the resurrection's more possible yeah sure can, can you think of one well I, I wrote some down here um oh this one's yours just because lasers exist that doesn't mean lightsabers exist just because a god exists doesn't mean he rose jesus from the dead raised jesus from the dead 
Um, if there's an athlete who excels at football, that doesn't mean this athlete excels at hockey. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think I remember one. Uh, even if it uh, turned out to be true that there is the Loch Ness Monster, it, that doesn't mean that unicorns also exist. Correct. Oh, um, even if y Yahweh exists, that doesn't mean that Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, appeared to Muhammad in a cave. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So just Yahweh can exist. That doesn't mean he raised Jesus from the dead. Yahweh can exist. That doesn't mean the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad in a cave. Yeah, and, and people can still be raised from the dead even today, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean that Jesus was raised. Because the first video that you played, uh, famously, with Mike Laikona says, if there's a supernatural realm, then the plausibility of the resurrection goes up. Well, that's technically true. It just means it goes from zero to a very low plausibility, right? Because it basically, uh, Mike Lacona thinks that if he can convince his audience that miracles happen, he gets a resurrection for free. But it could be the case that we live in a world where some supernatural happen, uh, events happen, but others don't. Like uh, people who have been dead for three days just stay dead because God is not interested in raising anyone from the dead like that. Uh, so you don't have to actually and this this is something that i think atheists some sometimes do and it's a mistake they feel that the best way how to argue against the resurrection is to argue that miracles don't happen because if you can convince someone that miracles never happen then that automatically means that the resurrection didn't happen because that's a miracle but i think that's a like unnecessarily difficult position to hold you can just grant for the sake of argument that Yahweh specifically, not just any God, exists. Because then it's still improbable, like the resurrection is still improbable, because we know from past experience, from natural theology, that uh, Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to raise people. So we actually need very good reasons for believing that Jesus was the exception. And I'm sorry about the, the reasons that are given by Blake, for example, and by other apologies that address this issue. Uh, are just very weak. Um, like, for example, Jesus was a moral exemplar. How does it follow? Like, how connect the two dots for me? A, Jesus was a moral exemplar. B, God intended to raise him bodily from the dead after he was killed. I'm a moral exemplar. I don't exemplar. see how that follow. Camille, I'm a moral exemplar, and I really don't think uh, Yahweh will ever raise me from the dead. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it, like, uh, Blake, uh, who is the second most moral person who's ever lived after Jesus? Let, let's say for the sake of argument, it's like Mother Teresa or something like that. And who is the most immoral person who's ever lived? Let's say Joseph Stalin, right? And let's imagine that we go to their tombs and we look whether there's a body inside for Mother Teresa and for Joseph Stalin. What do you think is more plausible? Do you think it's more plausible that the bones of Mother Teresa are going to still be in the tomb? Or do you think it's more plausible that the bodies uh, and the, the bones of Joseph Stalin are in the tomb? I think the plausibility is, is about the same, honestly. I think it's very high. Oh, oh, um, uh, and I think it actually doesn't fall. Joseph Stalin, right? Hey, uh, Blake just entered the room. Uh, you have to uh, close the YouTube uh, tab. And let me uh, fit you in here. I've muted you right now, so I can't hear you just yet, but I'll unmute you as soon as I do some housekeeping. Oh, and uh, you need a camera, Blake. If you can hear me, uh, go to cam slash mic in the top middle of the green screen part. And um, <coughs> here, let me unmute you. Can you hear me? I can. Hold on. Let me turn my microphone. Excuse me, my camera is in Go ahead, keep talking. I'll make sure I can respond. Okay. We'll let you figure it out. Um, thing is, if I mute you, I don't know when you're done. If, but you, you for sure have a mic, uh, a camera? Yes, I do. I just have to figure out which point is. I prefer you. we can see you, but if not, uh, I'm okay with having you just an avatar. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. Well, it's good that Blake can join us. He'll be here. Let me uh, screen capture his box. Go like that. Oh, now he left, but he'll come back and the box should still work. I should start the music and sorry we ran out of time. <laughs> I apologize, Blake, but we're running out of time. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but we were talking about uh, Jesus being a moral exemplar does not help for one bit uh, raise the probability that he'd be raised from the dead. Um, what were some other ones he had here? Yeah, I think basically the they have the same issue because the problem is that the reason why these arguments are bad is because Christians are starting with a conclusion and they are trying to reverse engineer reasons, right? Like they already believe that Jesus was raised. So they are thinking, what's special about Jesus? And as soon as I ident identify something that makes Jesus special, they leap to the conclusion that, oh, this must be the reason why God intended to raise Jesus and not someone else. But the problem is that these arguments are either ad hoc, uh, they are non sequiturs, or they are just circular. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, Belief Math, the website, on that specific point is literally circular. It's like the various sections are interconnected with links. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. I, I always try to th try to figure out ways to articulate this to Christians watching without offending them too badly. It's almost like you have to don't disrespect the Bible, but don't respect it either. Don't, don't give it any benefit of the doubt, but don't just slam it to the ground either. And when you do that, you end up viewing some of the claims in the Bible the same way you would um, that water bottle. Um, and the claim that it's going to rise off the table. You can say, no, I'm betting against that. I'm betting against that. And when you read some, let's say, stories in the New Testament, I think if you're honest with yourself, you would say the same thing. I'm betting against that. Yeah, it says that. Yes, it could happen. No, but I'm betting against it. I don't think the evidence overcomes my willing to bet a thousand bucks against. <laughs> and... Um, and so, but I think you're exactly right, Camille, that people come into it saying, but Jesus said this, he did that. We, we know these people he interacted with. They, they read the, Paul's epistles, they read the Gospels, for example, and they just think they're reading history. And maybe in some cases they are. But, uh, but we both know that there's many uh, ancient Roman biography that contains fiction. <laughs> Do you know one off the top of your head? Yeah, and it yeah, and you, you have to, uh, well, I would recommend an excellent book about fiction in uh, Greco-Roman biographies. It was written by Mike Lacona, who shows very persuasively that uh, authors of these biographies like Plutarch just conventionally invented details uh, in their biographies, even though they were based on real historical people. And of course, Mike, uh, does that research in order to show that contradictions in the Gospels are not a problem. They are just results of Greco-Roman historians doing what these sorts of historians did. But he's obviously massively shooting himself in the foot because he can then argue, for example, that Jesus was raised bodily because in the Gospel of Luke, he eats a piece of fish. Because that could, of course, be the one of the details that uh, the author, whoever that might have been, invented. Um, yeah. Uh, Justin Maurer, I think that's who pronounced his last name. Justin Maurer says, Camille and Doug, if Jesus is God's son, the probability of him being raised from the dead are were very high. And Absolutely. Watch this, uh, Justin. I am God's son. And when I die, the probability of me rising from the dead has gone up because I'm God's son. Would you make that bet? This gets to the Christian's idea that, oh no, the Bible is something special. It's something to be revered and respected. And when it says that Jesus said he's the Son of God, 
and whatever that means. <laughs> Just because you're, you say you're the sun god, that actually doesn't mean you're divine either. But anyhow, that's a different actually, topic. Actually, like, let's say for the sake of argument that it's true that you are a son of god. Does that mean that you are going to be raised after you die? No. Like, how does that follow, right? Yeah. Where does it say? And that... even if I say I predict I'm going to die next week, and I'm the and I'm telling you I'm the son of God, and I will rise from the dead, does that raise the probability that I, Yahweh, the one that we've already granted exists, is going to do it? No. Yeah, it's, it's very important to realize that the people who wrote the New Testament obviously already believed that Jesus was raised. So it's not surprising that they would write that this is something that God intended to do. Like, it would be really weird if they wrote, yeah, Jesus was raised, but it was actually despite what Yahweh wanted, right? So, of course, the New Testament is going to say that uh, Jesus, uh, that God intended to raise Jesus. Because it was written by people who believe it happened, right? So you can't actually use the New Testament as evidence for uh, the for God intending to raise Jesus, uh, because that's circular. Um, one possible road that you could take is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. But uh, people who have watched uh, this channel for a while know how we deal with that. <laughs> because basically the Old Testament is where Christians got that idea from. Um, so it's not a fulfillment, it's just a mimesis. By the way, for the doubters out there, um, I am the Son of God, I am predicting my own death, and I will rise from the dead. And for all you doubters out there, I can even heal the blind. Here he comes. There we go. Welcome, Blake. Good, how are you guys? Oh, your sound is horrible. Oh, I can fix that. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't want to be greedy, though. I want, to, I want to, to start talking with you, so I don't want to chew up time trying to get... And it's my fault. Well, I kind of... No, now you're muted. Now I can't hear you at all. Can you hear me now? There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're in business. <laughs> okay, so Hi, congratulations on the newborn baby. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're jazzed. It's wonderful. <laughs> There's your so, yeah, I'm background. super honored. Y'all are, are having a whole episode on, on belief map. Yeah. Yes, we, want, we need you to sell, sell, uh, sell us on the idea that the probability of the resurrection is like really high. So let's mm -hmm. not talk about the, the empty tomb or the conversion of Paul or James and stuff like that. Just let's just focus on the prior probability and let's let's bump it as high as it as possibly can. Yeah. So I, now I think uh, I tend to agree with Mike Lacona and it's probably somewhere in like one in one billion. Uh -huh. 100 billion, he said. Yeah, I think yeah, one, one in 100 billion, because I think that's the number of people that have ever lived. Uh... Yeah, let, let me say in, in the background, um, when you're thinking about prior probability, one way to think about that is what, what are sort of the background objections to the, the very hypothesis that you're proposing? And you'll notice that belief map is designed to help um, allay those those biggest worries of prior probability. So that's why the first question is, does God even exist? Which you said, you know, you'll grant for now. Is Jesus a real historical figure? Which you know, you'll grant for now. Um, one of those, which is pertinent uh, to the question of a prior probability is, is Jesus special in any relevant way? Is there anything about Jesus that would incline God, because we're assuming God exists, to raise Jesus while simultaneously not raising anybody else. Is Jesus special in any way whatsoever? I'd say um, no. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, there might be a few. So let me let me pull up belief map and we'll we'll look at a couple of these. Um, so And whatever you're about to say, Camille's mm -hmm. gonna ask you, is that a minimal fact? Okay. Um, why would you why would you say that? Yeah, because I think the biggest strength of the minimal fact apologetic is that uh, you can only take, the, or it's sufficient to only take facts that a vast majority of New Testament scholars agree on, regardless of their personal bias, like mm -hmm. Muslim, atheist, Hindu, Jewish scholars. You don't have to 
bring in claims that pretty much only conservative evangelical Christians agree on. Uh, and still, the resurrection is the most plausible hypothesis, right? Yeah. But, it's, but it seems to me that when you make an argument that the prior probability of the resurrection is high, you have to bring in claims that are not minimal facts, that mm -hmm. are not in a majority in the New Testament scholarly community, and also are facts that even believing Christian New Testament scholars would say, yeah, I believe it, but I don't think we can establish that as probably true using the historical method. It's a, a theological assumption. Yeah. Here, you, here's, let me say, that? do you agree with what, that. just hang on, Blake, do you agree with what uh, Camille's saying? Like, for example, Jesus claiming he is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that that is something that you can demonstrate or show using the historical method? Oh, yeah. Uh, not, not just the claim that he actually was a son of God. Because uh, these are two different things. Right, like, right, you right. can establish that he claimed that, which I'm not sure if that's in the consensus. Probably, yeah. yes. Yeah. But it, you then it, you have it, to it show that he claiming actually was to be the son of God is. Let me say briefly, I um, I don't claim to be making a minimal facts approach. Just so you're aware of the background, when Gary Habermas and these guys introduce the minimal facts, they're introducing it to lay Christians for them to use out in the field. And the idea is, how can I most efficiently convince someone that Jesus rose from the dead? And instead of getting it all into all the nitty gritty of you know academic back and forth, most people will find uh, find it persuasive. Uh, that a, a given fact is true if you can honestly tell them that this is unanimously granted by people from every angle. If you can say that, you don't even have to waste any time getting into the details. And the power of this particular approach for the lay apologist on the streets, or maybe if you're doing a quick debate, is you can get everybody to agree on some minimal facts. It's a rhetorical uh, technique, a good one, um, because using these minimal facts, you can make a case for the truth of the resurrection. This is not, just so you understand, this is not a stricture on rationality. You can come to believe in the resurrection without limiting yourself to minimal facts. In fact, you have many beliefs right now that aren't based on minimal facts in the relevant field. Um, so at the end of the day, you've got to do the hard work. You've got to dig into all the evidence whatsoever. And all that belief map is going to try to do is it's going to, it will tell you about those scholarly consensuses when they arrive, when they're relevant. But are, are you admitting? Be... But are you conceding then for us that based on, uh, if we were using just minimal facts, we could not mm -hmm. raise the prior probability of Jesus being raised from the dead? Yeah, I don't. At least on the there have been different versions of minimal facts. None of them, to my awareness, speak to prior probability. So um, in the background, so everybody comes with us. to the table. Yeah, everybody comes to the table with a prior probability already for the truth of the resurrection. Some people, because they think there's no God, there's not even a historical Jesus. I mean, it's just almost useless to try to present even the minimal facts to them because it's gonna do nothing. On the other hand, you're gonna have a lot of people who think, yeah, there's a God. I'm sure Jesus is a historical figure. And I even think something's kind of special about Jesus. He's the kind of person God might raise from the dead. If you present the minimal facts to that kind of person, um, you're going to stand a much better chance of, of being successful in, in persuading them. They're going to look at that, and it's going to change their worldview. But when you say um, he's the kind of person that would be raised from the dead, you're basing mm -hmm. that on a text. Yeah, um, well, real quick, it doesn't matter what, what they're basing it on. In this case, it's the person themselves. They just have a particular belief right now, and their belief is Jesus is special. Jesus isn't like my next-door neighbor. Uh, the fact that God won't raise my next door neighbor from the dead doesn't it just is, isn't relevant to whether he'd raise this guy who made these radical claims about himself. Who I just made a whole bunch of radical claims just before you came on. <laughs> Sorry? I, I just made a whole bunch of radical claims just before you came on. I, yeah, said, so I, I, you, I told yeah. people I could, I could heal the blind, mm -hmm. and, I, and I told people that I, I know when I'm going to die and that I will rise from the dead, and I'm mm -hmm. the son of God. I am special. Do yeah, you, yeah. Do you believe so that's me, going to happen? Sure, sure. I mean, and obviously in the background, everybody knows you're not you're not trying to tell the truth. But in this particular case, and again, th this is going to be different. Hang on, for everybody. hang on. But do you, do you believe that that's going to happen? That, that I'm going to die and then I will rise from the dead, based oh, on yeah, what I just said. Not. Yeah, you you know the answer to that. Okay, of course not. <laughs>
Now, but you put that same story 2,000 years ago and then you do believe it. No, no, no. Here, let me, let me elaborate um, <laughs> on the difference. First, remember, this is all probabilistic. I'm not presenting a deductive argument. I'm, uh, you're on a scale um, uh, from zero to one, your confidence level in the resurrection. And all I'm going to try to do is introduce new data that will move you further along the scale than where you were prior, previously, okay? Some, your background belief or confidence in the resurrection might be so low for good reasons that it, I, could, I couldn't do it very quickly. So I'm going to give you information that's going to move you a little bit. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a claim about how much. Here's the information. Um, grant grant me that God exists because we're doing that for the sake of argument. Grant me that Jesus is a real historical figure. And now we've got a problem. God never raises people from the dead, or at least let's presuppose that for now. What are the chances that God would raise this guy from the dead? There's no. Is there any reason why God would uniquely raise Jesus? Let me give you. Not something that you have to believe, but a plausible reason about why God might. Here's the reason. Jesus claimed to be the unique son of God. That is a historical fact. Jesus at least was thought to perform many miracles. In other words, to be something like God's chosen. Jesus was understood to be sinless by his contemporaries. I'm not claiming he actually was, but he's the kind of person who would fit within this general message that Jesus proclaimed, which was, hey, if you're sinless, um, you're going to heaven. You will be raised from the dead. So when Jesus dies, based can, on the message we, that was... Can we take the first one? You said the first thing you said was he claimed to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's or the special? Son of man, even, which is a bigger claim. Do you think yeah. that's special, that claim? No, the son of God was, it was a special claim, but the son of man was the bigger claim. That was actually a claim to being one with God. Okay, so... Does that claim, saying uh, that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, the unique Son of God even, does that raise the prior probability for you? That um, Jesus was special, yes. Now, again, I don't have to believe it. That's not enough. To, I, don't even, I don't even need to believe he did this. But it can separates I, Jesus. It can distinguishes I ask a question? him from my na neighbor. Sorry? Can I ask a question? Yeah, so please. let's, uh, let's um, grant for the sake of argument that Yahweh exists. Mm -hmm. How do we know that Yahweh would be interested in raising the Son of Man? Like, where does that information come from? Yeah, um, so if Jesus is, a, is the Son of Man, then he's, that's hearkening back to the book of Daniel and talking about the Son of Man coming to judge. Um, it's a it's a divine figure, the Son of Man, and all we have to say at this point is the the way the fact that God doesn't miraculously deal with my next door neighbor is irrelevant to whether God would miraculously deal with the Son of Man. And does um, the Book or, of Daniel say that the Son of Man is going to be raised from the dead? It, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. It can that, but it doesn't say it. No, yeah, it, it doesn't. But it doesn't have to, not even and, close. And were there? Okay, me, me why, an why do you think that Yahweh would be interested in Wait. raising Son of Man from the dead? Sorry, guys, one second. Yeah. Okay. Dude. okay. Let me give you an example. Um, so um, let's say we're we're considering this hypothesis that I gave a person a hundred dollars, okay? Or let's let's say five hundred dollars, okay? Um, and I in, in, and you say, look, how many people have – this is ridiculous that Blake would have given $500 to someone. Look around. How many people have, has Blake given $500 to? That's never happened before um, you know, as a gift, not to buy something. Um, and then, and then I, my response would be, wait a second. What, what if this is like my son? All right? what, if there's, what if there's something unique about this individual? Well, wait a second. Uh, it, there are lots of fathers who haven't given their son a five hundred dollar gift, right? And mm -hmm. that's equivalent to your objection that hey, it didn't say. No, that. it's it's actually mm -hmm. not because in your analogy we have a lot of uh, evidence and experiences with how family relations work and how money is handed in families and stuff like that, and that informs our prior probability. But that uh, doesn't transfer to this situation. You would have to actually show. Like, where are you getting the information that Yahweh, El Elohim, intends to raise Son of Man 
sons of men mm -hmm. uh, from the dead. Like you need to show that that claim is actually true. Plausibly. No, 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 I, real quick. Sorry, I disagree. I don't need to show that he intends to do it. I need to increase the plausibility in the same way. Sure. If we're, if, real quick. So do it. Please, please. If we're considering the hypothesis that I gave $500 to someone, I don't need to demonstrate that Blake intended to give $500 to someone. We just need to introduce some information that makes the hypothesis not crazy. And in this case, I'm, I don't need to show that God intended to raise the son of man from the dead. But the fact that God is a person means we can think about <laughs> psychologically the fact that there's a difference between the Jesus, in this case, the son of man, and my next door neighbor. God is far more inclined to deal miraculously with one than the other, and we can all see that. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Oh, we can't hear you. You mentioned Daniel as part of your support earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many people who could read Daniel. There were many people who could read Daniel and and sort of see what was coming. How many people like Jesus do you think existed in the first century, making claims, similar claims like Son of Man? Messianic claims, yeah, probably quite a few. Quite a few. So that now lowers the specialness of Jesus, does it not? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you. But, but not a lot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, could, could, there could have been a thousand of these. Well, places. there definitely weren't a thousand. But even if there were a thousand... Uh, compared to the wholeness of humanity and how many people there have been throughout history, it, it makes very little, when you look at the probabilities, it, it makes very little difference. Um, those Each of those persons, though, would have some claim to specialness that would distinguish them from my next door neighbor. And I would be far more inclined to believe that God supernaturally acted on one of them, if you gave me evidence, than I would to believe that my next door neighbor did something miraculous when like, he has no claim whatsoever. In the case of Jesus, though, we don't just have his claim to being the Messiah and the Son of Man. We have lots of interesting things surrounding this man that distinguishes him as being special. We look at his impact on history, on human, on human hearts, and how people have been inspired by his moral teachings. It's almost as if he came from somewhere else. At least some people would say that. He has a, he has, he, there's some about Jesus. Uh, the way he acted in How do you know how he acted? Ministry, um, these are things that non-Christian historians will will testify to. Um, you know, like the way the way he would treat Samaritans, the kind of teachings he would give that are deeply based in love. That was very counterintuitive to Jewish thinking at so the you time. You think that actually happened in history? Oh yeah, and, and it's not just me. This is stuff that you'll get from non-Christian scholars as well. I'm, I'm sorry, but like, if you treat the Samaritans nicely in the first century. How does it follow that Yahweh is going to raise you from the dead? Yeah, like, I, connect yeah, these two true. dots from for me. Uh, like, you are just giving me claims that are are not moving the prior probability at all because I don't see how that's any indication of Yahweh wanting to to raise Jesus. Sure, let me let me help. Um, suppose that Jesus stood out in ways that suggested he was from above that he was connected to God in a special way. Would that be relevant if I could like, do that? Like Elijah, for example? Sure, what, whatever. If I could show that Jesus was very specially connected to God through in, in what he teaches and, and, and preaches and what he claims of himself. And, and um, if, 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 Jesus, if I could convince you that Jesus at least plot, was more plausibly connected to God as a special individual, prophetic or otherwise, than your next door neighbor, wouldn't that be relevant to the prior probability of I think him, his body, of him physically being raised from the dead and mm -hmm. exiting his tomb, leaving it empty? I would say no. The answer is no, Blake, and here's why. Yeah, David was special to God. In fact, I think mm -hmm. I think King David was uh, God's. Yahweh says this is the man I love. Uh, um, Solomon was special to Yahweh. He didn't rise him from the dead. Elijah. Yeah, Moses, Elijah. Actually, Elijah was raised from the dead, sort of. No, he didn't even die. He just went up. He did, yeah, he <laughs> did. Yeah, there's a big misunderstanding going on here. I think that you're, maybe we're used to thinking in terms of deductive reasoning, where I'm trying to give sufficient conditions. No, no. I'm saying I got 10 special people in the Old Testament. None of them were raised from the dead. Jesus mm -hmm. is just number 11. I have now, now, you're saying now it's one out of 11? I agree. Just so you understand, even. It, Let's say I wasn't a Christian. I, let's say I was a Jew, okay? 
and I started to coming across all this information about Jesus, and I started to think that Jesus was special, I also, right along with you, would not expect God to raise Jesus from the dead. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. However, I would be far more open in those circumstances to concluding that God did raise Jesus from the dead if I was given evidence. So yeah, we are open. Uh, we just don't think the prior probability is very high. The right. openness is not an issue. The prior probability is the issue. You're you just giving me reasons that don't right. raise it. Yeah. Do you agree that openness comes in degrees? Yeah, sure. But okay. it's not the, the same as prior probability. Uh, well, prior probability is uh, it's synonymous with plausibility, right? And in, in inference to the best explanation. And openness is a synonym, essentially. The more open you are to the conclusion that God raised yeah, you. Yeah, I, I disagree. Uh, prior probability is just a prior probability of a hypothesis giving the background knowledge. It has nothing to do with how open you are to accepting, like belief revision, basically. That's uh, your subjective state of mind, right? We want prior probability ideally to be something objective, even though I'm not a, an then objective let's, Bayesian. Let's call it rational openness, the openness that you ought to have. Sure. This is, this is not an issue we are as rationally open as humanly possible. We are just interested in raising the prior probability. And like, sorry, to be honest, I don't see how Jesus being a son of man raises the prior probability of him physically walking out of his tomb um, three days after he died. Like do, those two Wait. data points are completely disconnected. Not Sorry. even the Old Testament say that the Son of Man is going to be raised. Just to make sure we don't aren't, aren't disconnected here, there's a sense in which you're probably far more open to believing that my next door neighbor just visited than to believing that my next door neighbor was doing flying cartwheels in the sky. OK, that openness, at least if it be charitable with me here, corresponds to the prior probability you assign to those different hypotheses. In that sense, I hope you understand the sense I'm making. There is a sense in which prior probability correspond. Your prior probability corresponds to your rational openness to the hypothesis. Does that make sense? I agree that people who are not open to belief revision are unlikely to assign a high prior probability to a belief that they are not open to have revised, but it's not the problem with us uh, because we are open. Um, okay, let's, let's get let's get rid of openness because there's a disconnect sure. about what I mean and what you're what you're hearing. We're, we're, so, hey just, guys, we're wasting time here. I'm I'm nodding off, which means that probably 50% of the people in live stream chat are nodding okay. off. Let's get okay, really okay. focused here, okay? The, give me the best reason, the best argument for why the prior probability is high. Because let me tell you right now, like we, Doug, Campspires, not sure if you know who that is, uh, the, um, we think that the reason why Jesus seems to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, mm -hmm. why he seems to claim that he's the Son of Man, the Messiah, or the, um, the Son of God, is because the early Christians got it from the Old Testament. Yeah. That's where the theology comes from. The so it's not surprising that the New Testament would make those sorts of claims. And it's not even surprising, to, or it's not even unexpected to think that Jesus himself uh, made those claims because he's just got it from the Old Testament, right? That Jesus would rise from the dead, that claim, or? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm like, as a, an atheist, I'm completely open to the idea that Jesus, the historical person, actually told his disciples at some point, I now have to go to Jerusalem to be crucified because that's going to atone for the sins of humanity. Uh, because Jesus just got it from the Old Testament, from Daniel, from Isaiah, right? Like, if even you, I'm expected uh, to think that Jesus thinks that you are the Messiah and you believe that the Messiah is the Son of Man and uh, the suffering servant from Isaiah, then you have the, the whole New Testament theology already, right? Um, so that's the other issue. Like the reasons that you are giving me for believing that the prior probability is high uh, are actually also reasons for a naturalistic explanation of the original Christianity, right? So it doesn't raise the high, uh, prior probability relative to alternative explanations. Uh, so several things. First, I don't think the prior probability is high. All, all I want to do, my project, because for me, the whole game, 
most of the game here is the evidence. That's what I'd love to focus on. But the objection is that the prior probability is low. And my job would be to fend off this objection and to say, wait a second. It is crazy that God would raise Jesus from the dead. It's not crazy that, or the, it's, yeah, it's crazy that God would raise my neighbor from the dead. It's not crazy that he would raise Jesus. And, and here are the reasons why it's not crazy. That doesn't involve me making the case that God would raise Jesus from the dead. That's way too strong. I can't do that. Okay. So I don't think can the you, probability uh, high. Can you, can you put a number on it? Um, no. I mean, it's going to be like 0. 0.000 something. Is it because I there was a workshop on the prior probability of the resurrection, and I know that uh, Timothy McGrew put it in like one in one billion or something like crazy low, yeah. and Richard Swin Swinburne put it in one in one thousand. So you have like a, both theists both wrote prominently, both are using the the Bayesian epistemology, and they have a different like estimate which differs in orders of magnitude. The, yeah. So, like, are you closer to one in one thousand or one in one billion or one hundred? I'd, I'd be closer to Timothy McGrew. Not, I mean, not. I'd be in between them, <laughs> probably. Yeah, I, I would probably. And that's normal. Well. When, when you when you do evidence assess for anything, and you ask a bunch of people who are are thinking about it, what's your prior? They're all going to differ, and sometimes they can work it out and get closer as they talk to each other. Um, but that's normal. That's not like a, a bad mark against Bayesian inference. That's just normal. Um, and do you think there are naturalistic explanations that have the same likelihood ratio of the evidence for the resurrection that have higher prior probability? Uh, real quick, I did want to make a comment about something you said earlier, and then I'll yep, go sorry. back to that. The, the one thing to notice is you, you seem to think that the Old Testament provided the grounds for Jesus' prediction and the Messiah's prediction. Just a quick thing to notice is that none, no other Messiah, and there were quite a few claimants to be Messiah, um, anticipated being risen from the dead. And non-Christian scholars aren't even sure that Jesus anticipated being raised from the dead. What they will say is that he anticipated being vindicated by God. Okay, go back to your question. Do you want to repeat the question or? I, I yeah. think the, the, he, Camille was asking you for the best reason to raise the prior probability of Jesus being raised from the dead. What's your best reason? We already kind of stroke claimed to be son of God off the list. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I'm okay. So I think I've got like eight reasons. The best one would probably for the for the prior probability might be the um, that God would uniquely raise Jesus from the dead. Uh, it could be his it, gigantic impact on on human history. So Jesus, if Jesus were a special figure of God, it's not that implausible that he would be an important figure in human history. Uh, we're talking who's, about... the, who's the who's the second most important figure in human history? And I think you you see where the question is going, right? No, no, I don't. Go ahead. Uh, so it, who's it, who's the second most important person it, in is human it Muhammad? history? Sure. So do you think it's more plausible that Muhammad was raised compared to your next door neighbor? Yeah, or, or a miracle was performed. It's far more plausible ha, ha, than a miracle. Do you think it's more like if we go to Muhammad's tomb, assuming mm -hmm. that we know that is, where that is, and we go to uh, a tomb of my great grandfather who was a, an insignificant farmer, do you think it's more probable that we would find the tomb of Muhammad empty? Uh, or do you think it's more probable that we would find the tomb of my great grandfather empty, um, assuming the evidence is the same for both? Yeah, that the the hypothesis that God would miraculously raise Muhammad from the dead um, is far higher than that God would raise your any of your relatives. Really? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Wow. I would not have expected That's... that answer. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Blake, remember, okay, remember, hang on. Blake, are you saying that? Quick. I, I really think you're saying that to save your skin here. Like, you really believe that Muhammad, it's more likely that Muhammad would be raised from the dead than a guy like me? You really mm -hmm. believe that? Yeah. Well, do, do you think it's more likely that why? Adolf Hitler was raised from the dead than my great grandfather? <laughs> because he had more impact on human history than my great grandfather. Or, Ching, or Genghis Khan, you know? Yeah, yeah. Here, here's the reason why is because raising Jesus or whoever from the dead would serve as a kind of miraculous vindication for the message that the person proclaimed. So if Jesus is 
participating in the world as a sort of prophet making grand claims. Um, and if, if he's really connected to God, it's far more likely that God would choose to vindicate Jesus, whether it's by resurrection or something else, than it would be to, again, do some special vindicating miracle on my next door neighbor. And again, it, it can still be super low. All I need to do is I need to prevent the probability from being prohibitively low uh, so that when we reach the next phase, which is evidence weighing, um, the evidence can actually bring you to the actual conclusion that God did raise Jesus from the dead. I'm hearing um, so I'm kind of go ahead. I'm hearing you say uh, when we asked for your best reason after we stroked off claim to be son of God off the list, uh, you, you said someone you raise the prior probability of resurrection on someone who has a huge impact on the world. I think that's how you phrased it. Something like someone that. famous, a celebrity. And and Camille brought up Muhammad, who's had probably the second biggest impact on this world in terms of religion, because it's the second biggest religion in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm still flabbergasted that you think that the probability of God raising Muhammad from the dead is higher than me because it's prior he, probability. Yeah, prior probability compared to me just because he's has the second largest false religion in the world. <laughs> I, I don't get it, Blake. Help me understand this. Well, or, you might put it in the evidence category then. So let me focus then on reasons, if that's not helpful to you. Let me focus on things that would give God a special reason to raise Jesus from the dead. And like you said, we're setting aside for the heck of it right now Jesus' special claims uh, to be um, to be the, the son of man, to be a divine figure. Um, focus in on Jesus's uh, claim um, to uh, of forthcoming judgment, right? So when Jesus came to earth, or at least on my theology, he, when, he, when his ministry was occurring, he was telling everybody, hey, uh, a judgment is coming, okay, on, on sinners. We're, we're guilty uh, and judgment is coming and you need to repent of your sins, Right. And so he was he was playing the role of a prophet. Now, is God does God have more of a reason to miraculously vindicate a prophet than a next door neighbor of mine? I, I, think I say no. I think I think the most important words that you've said so far is at least according to my theology. I, because I, I, I think that, that I took that out. I fixed it by saying, okay, during his ministry. Well, hey, I, I think I think that's what really what this really all boils down to. Um, hang, hang on, Camille. Here's a picture of John Hagee. He almost weekly makes predictions of an apocalypse, the end, ending of the world. Are you saying it's more likely that Jesus or God will, God will raise John Hagee from the dead than yeah, me? Yeah, especially if he was a, mirac a, a miraculous prophet. But yes, even if he didn't perform any miracles, which I assume he doesn't, and I don't know anything really about him, but yeah, if, if, he's, a, if he's really performing the role of a prophet, that increases the prior probability. And how do you it know make that? It high. It how do you make know it this? High, it's better than the next one. Yeah. Neighbor. How do you know that this is true about God? How do you know that it's the case that Yahweh is more mm -hmm. interested in, than in raising someone like that from the dead mm -hmm. than someone insignificant, a 19th century farmer? Because you, you can on, make let him out answer. reasons. Let him answer. To mm -hmm. motivate the prior probability, but then the other thing is. Can a historian establish that this is actually true about Yahweh using the historical method or yeah. some other method? Um, yeah. Two, let right. me say two things. One, I'm going to directly answer, and then I'm going to make a meta, a meta comment, okay? The direct answer um, is, which I've already lost it, so now I'm going to go to my, <laughs> my meta comment. My meta comment is, is that there, we have to be wary of rhetoric at this point. Okay, about what's going on. It's very easy to mistake what I'm doing with the claim that God would probably choose to raise Jesus from the dead. Um, and you're and you can make me sound absurd if you put that that shoe on me, which is not what I'm doing. What I'm trying to assess is the prior probability. Okay, and that that's consistent with the likelihood of God's raising Jesus, as Timothy McGrew, the Christian, said being 0 0.000001 but as long as it's not 0, 0 with uh, you know to the hundredth power you've done good work okay i'm trying to get you away from having the 0, 0, 0, 0 to the hundredth power that's all i'm doing and so you can make me sound absurd by 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 
saying, wait a second, look, here's a guy that meets your criteria. Does would God raise Jesus? Excuse me, would God raise that guy from the dead? No, no, I understand that. I understand that. The, the okay. problem is that you are not actually doing that. Okay. Like at all, because I don't think it, like, like you think mm -hmm. that it's fine to move the probability at least a little bit. So the reasons don't have to be like super strong. Uh -huh. But my problem is that the things that you're saying, like it doesn't really follow from them. Mm -hmm that the probability should move at all, right? Yeah. It's like, like um, there is a tree outside the door, like outside my window. Therefore, like that raises the probability that Jesus was right. Like what you're, what you're saying is like in the same category of claims, almost, like, at least it's relevant to the person of Jesus, but it's like the same non sequitur conceptually. And even if it was like, related in theory like on paper like if we could actually postulate that if x was true about jesus mm -hmm. then the probability of the resurrection would go up the prior probability would go up you would still have to show that this is actually true in reality okay. you would have to show that this is true about yahweh mm -hmm. and not just something that you're uh, proposing x hypothesis right let's mm -hmm. let's let blake talk yeah, I, well, I just wanted to explore your mind a little bit. If you're saying that these things I'm saying aren't even relevant, I want to I want to make sure that I'm hearing you right. Are you telling me that with respect to the question of whether God would choose to miraculously vindicate Jesus by raising him from the dead, it is irrelevant that Jesus was making big claims about himself and claiming to speak for God? Yes. Is, am I hearing you right on that? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's irrelevant, uh, hugely re irrelevant, and I, I, and I think even a lot of Christians can see this because you can think of many examples of of God's workers making huge claims, and yet God did, didn't raise one for one second that they're more likely that they would rise from the dead, from a prior probability I, point of view. I would, I would maybe, I would maybe uh, change my answer. I wouldn't say uh, I'm positive that it's irrelevant. I'm just not convinced that it is relevant. Like I would yeah. have to. I would have to have a reason for believing that Yahweh El Elohim, like once, like that, that, like I'm that um, a person making these sorts of claims about himself is an indication that that this being that exists and created the universe wants to raise that person from the dead after he dies. Right? It more, yeah, it was more likely to because remember yeah. we keep making this accidental shift to oh he would it's more it, th that he plausibly would yeah sure plausibly would even plausibly would like because you know y jesus was only raised if yahweh intended to right like right yeah, yeah. good good um okay so so just to, just to reiterate um it you're it, it's not clear to you that it's relevant that um jesus was making these big claims that he was considered to be a miracle worker that at least it sure seems like I would argue maybe this is something we could go back and forth on that he fulfilled prophecy. A lot of these things that seem to point that that connect him to God as a special envoy of God's. Why and, does Yahweh care about that? Like yeah, yeah. how does so it translate? Why would, why would God raise an envoy of His from the dead? Okay, is let me ask you this: Is God more likely to raise an envoy of His from the dead than to raise my next door neighbor? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't think, think we have. I, I would don't say have your have neighbor. Any... Sorry. Yeah. I would say your neighbor. You're you're saying that God would be more likely to raise the neighbor. Yep. And now try to figure out my reason. I have a reason. Okay. I'm listening. No, no. Think about it. Think about the scriptures you know. Mm -hmm. Who does God choose? The weak. Mm -hmm. The insignificant. The lower things, blessed are the poor in spirit. The reversals of expectations. I am the son of God, yet no one, don't tell anyone. Man, we're done here. Thanks for coming on, Blake. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it. Do, are, you, are you being playful or do you want me to respond to that? Uh, I'm being, oh, well, I'm always playful, Blake, but you can respond. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, um, yeah. There are so many people who are just uh, you're pointing out that he was nothing like God chooses. God chooses the people who are um, weak, usually is, is how uh, 
a pastor would phrase it. They're weak. They're there's someone who, if they do something great, it would glorify God rather than the, the last person. shall be first yeah. and the first shall and be last. That's 99% of humanity, right? I mean, that's just, that's, um, that's not going to be a very helpful predictor. Um, so it, that, that is true that, that there is an inclination for God to choose this kind of person. But I would point out that Jesus was, you know, a nobody from Galilee. He was, you know, by all rights and, and contemporary eyes, uh, a nothing. He was he was not rich. Um, he was not pretty looking. Um, he wasn't a general. He was not what people were expecting. Oh, so now you're making Jesus into crucified. a nobody. Sorry. You're, so you're saying Jesus was a nobody at the time? Yeah. But yeah, earlier you just said that he. Yeah, that was later. That that comes later. That that would that would probably more go in the evidence category that we're on the right track. But your neighbor could um, be, could impact the world in a bigger way than even Jesus did. Like, see mm -hmm. how this, but anyhow, I, I seriously, I'm getting bored <laughs> of this because it, we're not going anywhere. We're just spinning our, our wheels. Um, I actually would love to ask you my hypothetical flying man. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard me ask the flying man question. Uh -uh. Tell me, what is, what is this my, question? My great, great, great grandfather, I'm not joking now, this is serious. Uh, my great, great, great grandfather he um, went to the Grand Canyon. He took off all his clothes. He ran off the cliff mm -hmm. and flew. Just unaided, he flew. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that claim? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, what would it take for you to believe that? Um, gosh, I, I, I'd probably need to sit down and think about, <laughs> think about it. Because, you know, any evidence I could propose to you would have all these provisos next to it. <laughs> let me, let me, let me uh, put it this way. If if we found a diary where it said 500 people saw this happen, mm -hmm. would you believe it then? If it was a diary, I'd have to know a lot more about the diary. But so you wouldn't believe it off. Know. You wouldn't believe it. Just Sorry. Based, you wouldn't believe it just based on that. You'd need more. Oh yeah, of course not. Yeah. Okay. What if I told you that um, that not just a diary, but a specific person's diary named um, named, named Myron? He said that not only did uh, he appear did he fly <laughs> five in front of 500 witnesses but he flew right up to this guy named myron and myron you know says hey i'm myron and this happened to me would you believe mm -hmm. it then yeah so basically we've got two testimonies at best right right, right. Would yeah you believe it then no i don't think so no okay and what if no. and i obviously i don't think this is relevant but i'll keep playing go ahead so and what, what if um uh, about i don't know 30, 40, 50 years later, we had found four more diaries mm -hmm. from Myron, uh, Jacob, um, Peter, and, and um, Bill mm -hmm. saying, yeah, not only did the flying man fly, we saw this, uh, he did a lot of other things. Um, he went to su such and such place. Wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't believe it all. Okay. That we're, we're done. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, I wouldn't so, believe it either. And obviously you're asking that because you think that that's analogous to the Gospels, right? Well, uh, I, I think I, I, I put in the creed, the First Corinthians 15 sure. creed there. So that's mm -hmm. the earliest and best source a lot of people say. I put in the basics of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And I, what else did I layer in? I layered in that he went to real people in real places. Um, I layered in some, some meat. Oh, and, yep. and, and this flying man actually changed people's lives. He had a huge so here, impact here's, on society. Here's the difference. Let me, if I was going to be super quick, here's the difference. One is, unlike in the case for the resurrection, I don't know that we've ruled out the lie hypothesis. Right. I don't think we've ruled out the hallucination hypothesis. Right. I don't know if we've ruled out the delusion hypothesis. But he was uh -huh. in front of he, he was in front of 500 people. There, there's no such thing as group hallucinations, right? For 500 people, so that we stroke that one off. Uh, uh, illusion. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Do do we know that that even happened? Well, yeah, it was in the book. It was in the diary. I said. I don't say that it happened just because it's in the Bible. Like that's not how I reason. Oh, okay. So you don't believe it based just because it says so. Not just it's just because a document says something doesn't mean you should believe the document, and I right. don't do that. Okay. Um, but that, but at the same time, a document can say something, and it can be credible. And you have you have to get it, your hands dirty. You have so to. So what would you need to see then to believe it? 
sorry to believe that uh, the resurrection happened. No, no, or no, that my great 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 grandfather flew. To believe that a man flew. Yeah. Um. So it, okay, and then and that it was an illusion. This is tough. I might ask you the same. My answer is probably going to be very similar to yours. At the end of the day, um, it's going to require like some. And there's lots of different ways you could do it. Maybe one way is having a few different independent um, videos and yes. given people who I trust aren't lying, maybe who who have given some kind of evidence that they're not lying or that they haven't tampered with the video. Um, I would want some specialists to come and make sure that this isn't a natural phenomenon, some kind of wind event. That, yeah, <laughs> that one, here's – here's yeah, I – I agree with and you. Even then, I might not even believe it. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I was thinking about this too, and I was thinking maybe if there was like some crevice, like some opening in a mountain that only a man could fit through, not a helicopter or a plane, uh, that's really difficult to get through by ropes or something, have the flying mm -hmm. man put something there. So then later mm -hmm. on, when we got better technology, we could go back and find it. and um, Or maybe have the flying man fly across the ocean. And yeah. meet, meet people in every continent and have them record it. Wouldn't that be great if every continent had a record of this flying man <laughs> dated to the same time? Yeah. So, let, let me open up to you here just so you know how, how, know where I'm coming from. Um, I don't – It. I've heard – I've seen in the comments before people thinking, wait, he's, these are like double standards. And I want to insist I'm not giving double standards. If I had to boil down the difference, the difference is, is in the case of the flying man, I've got really easy naturalistic explanations that have not been ruled out. Okay, I just gave a couple and people would need to do a lot of work. In the case of the resurrection, and I haven't presented my case for the resurrection here in, in our meeting. We've been talking about this this one point. You can look at you know belief map or you can look at my discussion with Matt Delahunty to get a taste of my case for the resurrection. I struggle. Like if I was in, if I wasn't a Christian, I would struggle hard with trying to make sense uh, naturalistically of the data that we have. And I'm not talking about just something that a book said. I'm talking about data that non-Christian scholars unanimously agree is solid. Okay, um, the the big one is that the apostles, all non-Christians, agree with. I mean, is. <laughs> Aside from like the, you know, mythicists you know, like Richard Carrier and Robert Price, all pretty much remaining scholars out there, everyone who teaches at a university certainly, um, thinks that the apostles at least believed that Jesus appeared to them. And they had an experience that convinced them that Jesus appeared to them. And then I start thinking, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and believe that they had an experience that they at least believed was Jesus appearing to them. So they weren't lying. That's not a credible hypothesis today in academia. But the hallucination hypothesis is credible, surely. Why is lying and off the table? Sorry? Why is lying off the table? Because the apostles genuinely had this experience. They lived and died. Why? So what? Why is lying off the table? Because if because they wouldn't have lived the, the way that they did. How do you know the they way they lived? lived? Sorry? How do you know the way they lived? Oh, this is something that we can do pretty easily. Um, Non-Christian historians will tell you uh, all sorts of stuff that the— No, uh, I would claim you did. don't know how the apostles lived. I, well, then my, you my, my guess, against— I would, I would claim to you that if we had better evidence, like, we, mm -hmm. like what we do for Mormonism, we mm -hmm. would find dirt on these guys like you would not believe. We would find dirt on Peter. We would find dirt on Paul. We'd say, You're cra you believe this guy after what he did? Yeah, this is the type of stuff we have on Mormonism on guys like Joseph Smith because the evidence is way, way, way better. Well, let, let me tell you this: if you go to Oxford University, if you go to Princeton, if you go to any academic institution and talk to the heads of the history department, what they're going to tell you is yes, we can say quite a bit about Jesus, we can say quite a bit about his apostles, and you're going to find them, the non-Christians included, and they're going to be the majority saying that yes they at least believed jesus appeared to them and part of the interesting mystery that people and love why and is history that work out is why did they believe it why is that and relevant I, I i can go back to the flying man there was well, like, they're not lying that's what the they, historians will tell you is I that have, they weren't lying. i have like 12 people seeing the flying man they had mm -hmm. genuine experiences and they believe how do you know they're not lying how do you know though because the book did, says so 
well, okay, I don't believe it. I don't believe this just because of book. There, there is no passage in the New Testament that says the apostles were not lying. It doesn't work like that. You do history. You do hard work. Well, the, same there still, with the flying man. There's nowhere it says that these guys weren't lying. It just says they had genuine, they had experiences, and, and they, they actually even died for this belief later on, I found out when I kept reading. Mm -hmm. So suppose, let's make it a little more similar. Suppose we had a, a lifelong documentary on each of these guys or good – a good historical account of how they went on to live their life. If they lived a life that was incompatible with their lying, then yes, I would I would believe that they weren't lying. And that would only rule out the first naturalistic hypothesis. Then you'd have to rule out the other naturalistic hypotheses, like I feel I've done in the case of the resurrection. The hallucination hypothesis, for example, how have you ruled that out? You mentioned Oxford earlier that um, they all that p universities from Oxford agree that they had these experiences. Let me mm -hmm. uh, let me read from the Oxford Annotated Bible, page seventeen forty four. Mm -hmm. Neither the evangelists nor their first readers engaged in historical analysis. Their aim was to confirm Christian faith. Some would say that's another word of saying propaganda. Scholars generally agree that the Gospels were written 40 to 60 years after the death of Jesus, thus they do not present eyewitness or contemporary accounts of the Jesus' life and teachings. So this uh, is... That's not relevant to, to the same person who wrote that passage, assuming he's an historian, would still tell you, even if, even if the Gospels aren't uh, written by direct eyewitnesses, which is very contentious, if, if, if he's, I, don't, I need to read it again to see exactly what he's saying, but he would still tell you that it's not disputed historically. What's that not disputed the apostles, historically? That, that the apostles had genuine experiences that they thought were Jesus, was Jesus appearing to them. And he would still say that, yeah, the apostles are real figures. Yeah, they were still proclaiming Jesus. you don't Jesus, believe it for the flying man, why him. do you believe it for Jesus? Sorry? You, you, if you don't believe the genuine experiences of the flying man, why do you believe it for Jesus? The, the genuine, I don't, first off, you'd need to convince me that they're genuine, but if they were <laughs> genuine, you'd need to rule out the naturalistic explanations. I've ruled out that, at least I think I have, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to you from my perspective, I think I've ruled out the naturalistic explanations of the apostles' experience. Here's what you'd need to do for to help me out, because I want the truth. No matter what the truth is, I want to go there, okay? You sure? Number one. No, hang on, hang on. Yeah. This is serious. Are you sure about that? Because I don't know if you saw my introduction. But if you change your mind, if you were to change your mind here today or in the next week, you realize how you're going to devastate your wife? How I would devastate my wife? Yes. Yeah, but... It, so don't it, say that I'm, flippantly. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm serious now. It, but I'm sure. I'm serious now. Don't say that flippantly. Don't <laughs> say that you want to believe the truth if you're not prepared for it. Because mm -hmm. your wife will weep for months. Here's, here's what I would do, is I would convince my wife. I would explain... <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't give up. And, and now I know this you're is you're smiling and laughing, but I'm being dead serious. Marriages my... that, that's hard to do. But no, that's not going to stop me. Um, I mean, there are certain personality types, and I'm sure you're one of them, that if your wife was a believer in you, and I don't know your situation, I'm sure you would follow the truth regardless um, because it, that it's important. And, and I that, like it's what I do. I'm a researcher. I love this stuff. And there's a, a my. My, I feel like my life is centered around chasing and promoting truth. That's it's my greatest love. Um, so yes, I, I think I can genuinely say I want the truth no matter what it is. And here's what you would here's how you can help me. Here's how anyone can help me. Is one um, discredit the academic consensus that the apostles had or genuinely believed they had experiences of Jesus appearing to them alive not, from the dead. Not denying that. It, Okay, and if you don't deny that, then help me find a, a naturalistic explanation that is not as bad as hallucination or twin brother. Not as bad or as hallucination? Yeah. Hallucination is a pretty good one. Yeah, well, it would be, I think the hallucination hypothesis would require a miracle in its own right. Okay, hang on. Okay. Hang on. Uh, Camila wants to say something, but... See, I, I get this impression that you are coming from the point of view that most of the stuff in the Gospels and the Epistles you believe at face value. And the, this is the huge divide. Like, my guess is, do nope. you believe there was 12 disciples? Sorry? Do you believe there was 12 disciples? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and do you understand that, a lo I wouldn't say most, but a lot of historians, they don't? 
Um, I'm not sure what the consensus is on that. I know John Meyer wrote a, uh, an article on the Circle of the Twelve that was pretty influential. So I actually think say, the majority do think. No, it, I actually do think the majority do that because Jesus was echoing the twelve tribes of Israel. So yes, I think that's a, 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 a majority. <laughs> Yeah, well, By far. that's very easy to pin in later to make it fit. But but my point is, the point I'm making is, you're coming from the point of view is, hey, we had 12 guys here, or 11, who saw mm -hmm. the risen Jesus, and plus we had um, 500, but, you know, of course that might not be true. Uh, and we, but we have Paul, but that might not be bodily resurrection. But, but still, we have all these appearances. You're coming from that perspective, right? That this actually happened, that there was, that there was these people who made these claims of appearances, right? I'm not assuming anything. I'm going okay, with the evidence. Okay. Let's there. say there was only one. Okay. Only one people who claimed to have the, who genuinely had an appearance. So uh, you're saying, uh, so just so I know what you're saying, are you saying only one person claimed to have an experience? Right. right. Only okay. one people claimed. Well, it's, it's hard because the experience is real, but the attribution isn't. That's what I mean. So sure. okay. what, is it hallucin hallucin um, hallucinizing that now off the table? No. Okay. Wait, I, I don't you understand your whole scenario. You're, you're saying, okay, consider the hypothesis here or, or the, the data that one person is claiming to have an experience of Jesus appearing to him. Right, Blake? That's the, that's the, the data I'm giving you. Um, would you suspect hallucination? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, if it was just for one. Um, that's... Because what's what's tricky is, is yeah, that's the correct answer is yes. You and me, I think, if we didn't have anything at stake, we'd say, yeah, of course, hallucination is better, right? No, I need to know all the data because that, uh, that Blake, everything. come on, yeah, really? Or are you making, are you are you talking about like separate it from the New Testament? Just say like a neighbor was claiming that if Jesus easy, appeared to them. If it's easier oh, for you yeah. to think that way, sure. then can okay, yeah, I would hallucination yeah okay that, that takes away enough of the evidence that you'd need to convince me let's that. layer on two <laughs> let's layer on two but it wasn't at the same time two hallucinations uh -huh. hallucinations i can't say the word two of them two people claiming to have have seen jesus yeah right, right. do you believe it now and, and if i had no other data i'd, I'd suspect hallucination or lying right right how many do at what number do you say no that's a bad reason probably the same number as you there we go. We're not that much different. So when yeah, no, I, I hear you say that hallucination is bad, a bad reason, like you said that earlier, yeah. why do you yeah. say that? In, in this case, it's because um, I, I have good reason to believe, first off, ruling out the lie hypothesis. I do believe that they were telling the truth. Um, and if, if these people saw the experience together, maybe you were supposing that night and I didn't know that. Are you, are you assuming that these people were honest and they saw the thing together? No, separately. They saw Jesus appear together separately? Okay. Separately, it's not as strong. It's still there. In the case of the apostles, we have group. We have a group hallucination, several of them. You, but you told me it, earlier you don't believe things just— You told me earlier you don't believe things just because the Bible says so. Mm hmm So why do you— Just assume, because. Yeah, right. wh why do you assume that it was together? Um, because the, the earliest Christians, the apostles— were widely proclaiming throughout the communities that it was a group appearance. And here's how I know that. It's because of that creed that you mentioned a while ago in 1 Corinthians 15. We're talking about a creed that non-Christian scholars will say was circulating among the early churches. Right, but the you Jerusalem said... Church, you, real quick, real quick, just so you know the context. The Jerusalem church was the headquarters of early Christianity. The apostles were still there doing their thing long after Jesus had risen or passed or whatever you want to say. And they were regulating the churches all around in the area. And one of the creeds that was circulating among early Christendom, and we're talking from 30s to 40s, like right after the right after the alleged resurrection, was that Jesus died and appeared to Peter and the Twelve. To what Peter evidence alone, do you have prior to the First Corinthians 15 creed that any of that's true? Sorry, say that again. What evidence do you have prior to that First Corinthians 15 creed that any of that's true? The First Corinthians 15 creed dates to eighty thirty or eighty thirty two as eighty thirty three itself. So it, you can't get earlier than that, really. That's I'm as early for as evidence that any of that is actually true. The evidence that convinces all non Christian scholars that this creed is circulating at this early period. I'm not period. denying that the creed was there. 
I'm denying. Uh -huh. What evidence do you have to corroborate that, that creed, that belief, that the belief is true, that reflects reality? Uh -huh. Do you have any okay, evidence so, of that? So here, I'll, I'll give it to you. Step number one is what the creed does secure immediately and that you won't deny it secures immediately is that the apostles were proclaiming Jesus appeared to us as a group. That's step one. Okay, where? Do you show me, show me that they were proclaiming that prior to 1 Corinthians 15. You can't do prior than 1 Corinthians. That's right. as early as it gets. It's all after, isn't it? Sorry? It's all after, isn't it? So we have that creed yeah. first, and then we have the, apostle, the apostles saying these things later, as for example, in Acts and in, in the Gospels, right? You've confused me. When you, when you are asking me, uh, wh what is the earlier evidence? If the, if Jesus died in AD 30, and now we have a creed that scholars agree was circulating, the apostles themselves were telling people, the churches and everyone, I, quote, Jesus died. I, he but we was don't know that. I'm asking for the evidence us. of that. I'm asking for an independent getting, second here, here. source okay. piece of evidence other than 1 Corinthians 15. If they're Wait, you're saying you want me to get rid of 1 Corinthians 15? No, I'm asking for an, a second. Most historians say that one is really not that great, two is better, three independent sources, and so forth. I'm asking for an independent source. I see. Other than 1 you're Corinthians 15. You're asking for multiple attestation. Yes, for that, creed, that. for that creed that either is at the same date or prior. And, mm -hmm. and I think we both know the answer. It does not exist. No, well, the you can see the the contents of the creed echoed in several spots. Uh, so, in the Book of Acts, it shows up. Book of Acts in, is written uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years after. You're you're right, but it pulls in material. There's two halves of Acts. It pulls in really early material, creedal material. Also, in the Book of Mark, there's the pre-Mark and Passion. Okay, a, a source that long predates when Mark was written. So you agree that there's no, no independent source other than for that creed that that's dated near that time or prior. Yeah, these would be another couple. This would be another decade or two after before okay. these other sources. That's come fine. In. But hold on, I don't need multiple attestation for this. Nobody has that high requirement. Do you need it for the flying man? This isn't a flying man. This is just the apostles saying that Jesus appeared to them. There's no reason to doubt that the apostles were proclaiming, holy smokes, Jesus appeared to us, we saw him. What? And there's no reason to, to doubt group. that? Are you saying there's, Sorry? No reason, there's no reason to doubt that? Uh, I mean, I, if you, maybe if you find it incredible, but non-Christian Is there any reason to doubt the flying man? Real quick, this is not a flying man. Non-Christian historians who, are, who do not believe in miracles widely will tell you, yes, in, in those first few years, the apostles were, were telling all the uh, churches, and they all knew it, holy smokes, Jesus appeared to us as a group. We saw him. Those same historians will tell you those apostles were not lying. They, they almost certainly were not lying because of how they dedicated their lives, the way they would have ruined other people's lives intentionally if they were telling a lie, the way they put their own lives on the line says that they genuinely believed this stuff. Maybe they were mistaken, and that's why hallucination today is the leading naturalistic explanation for what happened to the apostles. And the hallucination hypothesis is incredible because you can't get away from the group nature. Are you aware that historians? Of, are you aware, sorry? Are you aware that historians agree that um, that Joseph Smith believed that he talked to an angel Moroni and found the golden plates? I don't. I don't think historians are reaching consensus on that i've researched that there's actually four signed um statements sworn statements from yeah but not that's only... not historians yeah yeah no that that was no, there was eight you there can was find, an eight... there's there's more on more on <laughs> mormon historians who's who specialize in reporting the beliefs of mormons mormons of that time does that mean that the beliefs of mormons at that time were true Wait, wait. Can you say that? Can you rearticulate that? Because I, I, I missed it. There are historians mm -hmm. who agree that Joseph Smith honestly believed mm -hmm. that God was speaking to him, that he okay. had a vision of God, that he saw sure. Jesus and God uh -huh. on his first vision. It's uh, in his first diary, first vision, vision diary. And there's, right, this, right. there's historians who report this, who report mm -hmm. the beliefs, the creeds, of Mormonism of that time. No, well, there's nothing analogous to the creed, but sure. 
I'm sure that they're historians. You have this idea, Blake. Blake, Blake you got to get out of your mind that this that Christianity is special. I know it's tough for you, yeah. but but whenever <laughs> I whenever I hear you say, "Well, there's nothing analogous to the, these creeds," I just I it, it drips and reeks of. But my religion's special. Don't bring up other religions. <laughs> Mormons no, feel I would that say the same. if I weren't a Christian, I'd tell you the same thing. There's there are important differences. You can't just of gloss course, over. But there's also important similarities, and the similarity and is we have claims of supernatural events that I don't think yeah. you believe for one second, even based on similar to even better evidence, like the flying man. Yeah. For so so in this case, you're saying, look, there are historians who will say Joseph Smith genuinely believed that Jesus appeared to him. That's your point, right? Yeah. There are historians. Smith, yeah. OK, it's not I don't know if it's a majority, but even if there's a few, first off, that's not enough to convince me because um, I I need the the majority, uh, like uh, the strong majority oh, really? that we have. in this OK, case. stop there. Stop but there. Secondly, stop there. Have, secondly, you haven't ruled out lying or or excuse me, you haven't ruled out hallucination in that case. Right. Yeah. So so are you uh, saying did I just hear you say that if if. 10 years from now, 51 percent of historians stop believing that the, that these disciples, apostles actually had experiences that of Jesus' appearance, you'll leave Christianity? I didn't say that, but that would that would radically undercut the evidence. Um, or at least it would, would undercut, it undercut enough that you would leave Christianity. Oh, um, I mean, there's I mean, I'd have to take into account what new evidences are there. That's a huge, complex question I'd have to think about. But I would I would be open to it for sure. I'm not going to say yes or no right now because I okay. don't know. That's just me being honest. Um, that's a hard question. <laughs> you have to sit down and think for a while, like, okay, this would happen. This would be the case, but I would think about it. I, okay. I think about this stuff. I love to think about it. Uh, I want to wrap this up. So I'll give you the last uh, Camille. Actually, you've been quiet for a while. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. The next time we talk, I'm going to present a, a, a naturalistic hypothesis that accounts for all of the pieces of evidence, at least as good as the resurrection hypothesis, and has a significant higher prior probability. That would, that um, would help me so much. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, have I, I know what you. I, I, I have what a playlist on YouTube uh, with uh, the resurrection debates. It's got over 100 hours now, oh, I wow. think. And I have to say, I was bored uh, because I wanted to uh, have the discussion about the prior probability. That was good because, as I said at the beginning, that's something that uh, apologists don't uh, talk about enough, probably because, uh, you know, if you're not Bayesian or you don't have a very strong training in epistemology, you don't realize that this might be an issue. Uh, but when, as soon as you got into discussing the specific evidence that's just running around in the same circles, like <laughs> I have a. Um, I have a like an FAQ word doc with all the objections and all the like talking points that Christian apologists bring up relevant to the resurrection. So I don't think you can say something that I haven't uh, heard uh, like a thousand times. Um, sorry. <laughs> I, I had there's a, someone in the chat. Um, yeah. There's someone in the chat who asked me to ask you, Blake, the um, poof or drown question. Have you heard my poof or drown question? No. Okay, so, what's the question? It's a hypothetical. You're up in heaven uh -huh. at, the, at the time of Noah. And uh, Noah says to you, hey, Blake, you see all those people down there? They're horrible, horrible people. I'm going to execute my justice on these people, um, except for Noah's family. They're righteous uh, in one of two ways, uh, two options. They're both moral options because I'm giving them to you, Blake. Option number one, um, I poof the men, women, children, toddlers, babies, newborn babies, uh, just poof them out of existence. Or option two, I drown them. Uh, whatever you choose, Blake, I'll go with. Both are moral because I'm giving you the options. What do you say, Blake? You don't know what's going to happen uh, according to the story of Genesis, but it's up to you. Poof or drown? I'd, I'd probably go with poof. <laughs> Very good. It, and, and then the follow-up question is, uh, does it bother you that uh, Yahweh actually went with drown if you believe it actually happened in history? I, I'm, I'm really um, epistemically humble in this and and i i'd be i'd be like i'd question it i'd i'd want i'd want to understand um believe, but at the same time you don't i've got enough happened? reason to believe that god is good that i would anticipate a reason even if i didn't know what it was you don't believe it actually happened in history um no i think it happened but i'm saying in the hypothetical scenario if god said this is what i'm going to do then i would be, i would that's how i would feel about it i'd be i'd be like wait what and and i'd want some understanding but at the end of the day, I'd anticipate that God had had justifying, good justifying reasons. Um, 
even if it's hard for me to see them. If um, if if your if you went up to your wife right now while she was holding your newborn baby and said, um, do you realize that the God we worship and serve drowned pe- babies like this 3,000 years ago, roughly? That Jesus did this? Jesus drowned babies? What would your wife's reaction be? She, she already knows. She's okay with... Jesus yeah, she knows the babies. story. She's, she's a, she went to Bible study. But no, but did you hear what I said? I put it in the terms of Jesus, not Yahweh. Oh, yeah. She well, she knows Jesus is God, and and I'm I'm being charitable, and I I assume that's what you mean, just God in general. Uh, right. Jesus is but use the name Jesus yeah. instead of Yahweh. I I actually yeah. challenge you to ask your wife that and see if it changes her impression of Jesus just for a split second. Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll do that, but I'll tell you, she'll ha- probably have the same reaction as me. And, and it's like, that doesn't, I already knew that, you know? <laughs> but this, so, so doesn't, so it doesn't bother your wife thinking that I don't, a baby is drowned, a toddler's drowned, doesn't bother at all? Oh, I'm, I'm, I mean, if you try to think back to any situation where there's suffering involved, I'm sure there, there's some bothering there. Uh, the question is, what do you do with that? And I, I'm for me, if, if the I guess if the ultimate argument is, hey, um, that there is either one, you shouldn't like God or two, you shouldn't believe in God. I'm not sure I can get. Well, to those here's the first step. Here's the first step. Acknowledge that it happened. Number one. Mm-hmm. And uh, and acknowledge that you're not OK with it. And mm-hmm. there's a few Christians who I've asked this question to who have done that. They've said, yes, I believe God drowned babies. And you know what? I don't like God for doing that. I really don't. That bothers me but he knows best, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. A lot of Christians can't even admit that. You know why? Because they feel like they're pitting, I'm the evil guy pitting their emotional intuitions against the God they worship and serve, which mm-hmm. I am, but yeah, yeah. at least admit it. I mean, admit that you're uncomfortable with the things God Oh, yeah, did. yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, no, no hesitation there. Okay, yeah. good, good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, any last words? No, I, I just I appreciate you so much. I know a lot of times people do a channel like this and they won't necessarily invite the guy you know they're talking about. So I I really appreciate you inviting me on. I I think what I you're invite doing everyone. Me. I invite uh, Frank Turek, uh, William Lane Craig, and at the end um, uh, some of them even show up. But then we always run out of time, so I have to. You know. Okay. <laughs> well, very good. Well, you got you got a good group here, so I I like to tune in and see what what's being said. So I appreciate you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Take Good to meet you as well. Bye. I put I, I, I put your uh, your web uh, page up on my, the description so people, oh, great. Okay. people can go check it out. All right. See you guys. See you. So after the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You should you should not shouldn't have uh, talked about the evidence because I, I was bored the whole time to be honest. It was just running around the same circle. Well, that was only at the end, right? Although the yeah, end I think was it was at least like half an hour, to be honest. At least yeah. it felt like it. Uh, probably because I wasn't the one talking. But uh, yeah. I think the first part about the prior probability was really good. I got my fix of talking to an apologist well, about something I shifted, I'm interested in. I agree. I agree. It was really good. And I shifted to the evidence, Camille, because I thought it was over like <laughs> yeah you know? yeah like th- just think about it like we asked him what is the best argument for thinking that the prior probability is high first of all he had to think about it really hard like i would expect that someone who does this for a living would just think of the reason like the best reason immediately and the second like why are we talking about the testimony of women and the empty tomb if the best argument for believing that the resurrection is even plausible to begin with is Jesus was a celebrity, basically. He <laughs> was very important. Like, yeah. oh, if, if you talk about the resurrection, these are the questions that you have to ask. Don't bother talking about the conversion of James or the, the martyrdom accounts and stuff like that. Just focus about this. Did you like my answer? Oh, I was I was shocked when he said it's more likely that um, that Muhammad, the the initiator of Islam, would it's more likely he'd be raised from the dead than me. 
I was actually shocked at that answer. Um, yeah. Because I would think he would at least say, ah, it's the same, because you're both just men. You know, Jesus was God, but you, you and Mohammed are just men, and, and Mohammed was actually worse than you, Doug, because he was preaching a false doctrine. At least you're... Uh... But did you like my answer when he said, what's more likely, um, a servant of God, a prophet, what's more likely that he be raised from the dead, or me? I said, me, or a stranger and your neighbor, because the last shall be first. <laughs> Reversal of yeah, I, I like that. And do you know, like, do you remember what his response was? He basically said that Jesus was nobody. Yes, he which, shifted from celebrity to nobody. <laughs> I, I, don't know if you, I, I don't know if you read the Gospels recently, but Jesus in the Gospels is, is depicted as being spectacularly famous. Like, he's followed by thousands of thousands, thousands and thousands of people. Throughout, no one people throughout come all, all the way Judea. from Syria. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is pretty strong evidence that if the Gospels say that he was known, that the miracles of Jesus was known all throughout Samaria and Judea, that, and yet we have no external sources of specific miracles. That's pretty strong evidence that it didn't happen. The lack of evidence is strong evidence against. Christians hate that yeah. when you say that. Oh, they hate that. I understand why they just... But yeah, it's... Ugh. I shouldn't have gone into the evidence, but people always say, Doug, why don't you go in the evidence? Go into the evidence. And <laughs> All you do is that street epistemology stuff. You know, let's dive deep yeah, in the evidence, my Greek. You have to, you have to let me handle it because I actually have a deck. I have the presentation on my alternative hypothesis. I think you know what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, I, we I about purposely it. did not want you to do it now. Yeah, it, it would probably need some time to to present it properly, but maybe we can set it up. Because I have to tell you honestly, like I would like at some point uh, to become like the T jump, but just for the resurrection, and just plow through all the apologists, like one every week, because I see the matrix in the resurrection apologetic now. Like I, I see the code. Uh, I've listened to so many um, debates and I've read so much stuff that like I am willing to bet a large amount of money that there isn't anything that a Christian apologist could say that would stump me. Um, so we can be like the like the new new atheists, right? Like D Jump is going to get them on the existence of God. I'm going to hammer them on the resurrection, and then you will bring the poof on the round question to seal the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and Cam can maybe talk about quantum stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was fun. <clears throat> and Blake is really nice. Like I don't like. He's a he's a genuinely likable guy. Like if if you compare it to your interview with Mike Lacona, he was much more stiff, right? Like. Um, like Ona? Yeah. Blake, even even when you were like really hard on him, he was always uh, at least he seemed uh, he's enjoying himself. I think uh, when I rewatch your uh, interview with like Mike Lacona, he almost uh, cried. Looks like he wants to be somewhere else. <laughs> you think I was hard on Blake? Ah. Uh... I'm not sure. I have to. I have to listen yeah, to it again. It. Because, like, you have to pick your battles. I don't think it's productive to argue that, uh, like, to argue the liar hypothesis, for example. I think you can just stand for the sake of argument that, like, Peter and Paul honestly believe that they are seeing Jesus, and you can still establish that the resurrection probably didn't it happen. Feel, right? I did it because it kind of felt good. Like it, it actually feels good for me internally to, to put it out there that Paul was a liar. It actually makes mm. me feel a little like I'm having some fun because it's, I know it's something, it's like a shock value. Like what? This is a man of God writing inspired words. Like you're calling him a liar. The, 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 the point I'm making though is it is more likely that Paul's a liar than a man rising from the dead. Yeah, so, so sometimes when I like uh, when I can't sleep late at night, I think about like how probable it, it, it is that Paul molested children. <laughs> I just don't have any evidence for it, because like Thomas Smith, okay. right? Like he had sex with uh, girls under age. 
Uh, not Thomas Smith, sorry, uh, Joseph Smith. <laughs> I'm sure Thomas Smith is a great guy. He has a, a couple of podcasts on atheism and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, but I, I don't usually argue this because it just turns uh, Christians off. Like you don't have to go there uh, and it's unproductive, right? Because they just uh, shut down immediately. If you suggest that uh, it's more probable that the apostles were lying and still willing to die for what they know is not true, yeah. then then the resurrection. No, it's um, <laughs> it's definitely more probable that um, that the whole New Testament is basically one big propaganda tool than a man actually rises from the dead. I know that's tough for Christians to hear, but and that yeah, and uh, just for full transparency, I don't think. Like, I honestly do not think that that's the most uh, probable hypothesis, right? Like, I do think that probably a vast majority of early Christians, and uh, including the New Testament authors, honestly did believe that Jesus raised from the dead. Uh, yeah. And that he appeared to them. It's just... Yeah, they believe that, but... Toast. We both know that even in the genre of Roman biography that there's a lot of massaging going on and fiction and myth so, so any questions from the audience uh, sorry if I didn't get to your questions guys uh, you should have Aaron White on your show please let your guest know that he has proven his discernment to me I'm a Nigerian prince and if he helps me I can make him very rich <laughs> oh Yokon West be nice <clears throat> that's funny though did Moses exist in history? Probably not. Yeah, Sierra. You're welcome, Heath yeah. Farley. Good to see you here, Neil Stefan. Tucker Horn. Special pleading. I don't think I've seen your name here before. Hello, Doug Dean. Okay. Time to get some work done in life here. Poof. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Again, you can check out his um, uh, belief map website. The links in the description. If see if your uh, pushback against Christianity is in there, and if it isn't, maybe let him know. Have a great, great day, guys. Take care. <laughs>